Okay, here's how I establish square using the Stabila LH180L. I come in five and a half and five and a half, and I draw a line. Then from here, I come five and a half. There's my cross hatch for my walls. I'm gonna turn on the laser, and I'm gonna let it self-level. I want the dot right on those marks, and this just allows me to kind of aim. I'm gonna do this all by feel and sound. Okay, so the detector's there, there's there. I'm gonna rotate the dial. Let your finger off every once in a while. Let this guy self-level. There it is. Solid tone. We always give it like five seconds to make sure that it stays solid. Double check that your dot is on the mark. Now I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna mark five and a half. For those of you that wonder, can I do it again? Was I just fortunate? Let's try it. I kinda wanna know too. Dot on, can you hear it? Now I'm gonna move this. Okay, see I'm close. <laughs> well, that was easy. Okay, should we try it a third time? Laser's off. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Okay, so I turned it on. Remember I want the dot right on the cross hatch. And I'm gonna adjust. Should we try it a fourth time? <laughs> that was insane. Okay, I didn't expect it to be that good. Okay, so laser's on. I'm gonna slide it over. Let it self level. Okay, you can hear that. I'm now I'm gonna adjust it. Okay. Okay, I'm letting it stop. Boy, I'm really close. Probably gonna go the wrong way. I wanna go this way. Nope, wrong way. That's okay. Hear it? I'm gonna let it. I'm real close. There it is. Nope, see, so this is why I like to let it set. Sit. Go the other way. Got cocky with the fourth time. Come on. Okay, there it is. So having this line to establish the base, hopefully you can see that with the GoPro. It just allows me to manipulate it by hand to get it close. And then if it takes me 30 seconds or even a minute to adjust this back and forth, it's still a one person operation. Let's get into the method to our madness. Notice that we are starting the framing in the garage, the wall framing. We like to frame all of those walls over on the main floor first. That way we're not working in the mud, I mean, it's pouring rain now as I do this voice over here, so I'm home. But it's just, we found it's easier because we got a nice flat floor we can set up over there, and then we can bring walls over and drop them onto the concrete. So we have that back wall, which is essentially our reference wall, because we can take a height for that wall over where it meets the floor system. So this clip is just to show you how we get our wall heights, but I'm gonna show you that in more detail right about now. Yeah, go for it. I'll keep my, uh myself out of the way of the laser.
Okay, so what Kyle is doing is we have a few different concrete heights. So he's control point using the 350, the Stabila LA350. He's gonna lift his two by six there. And basically that line, everywhere that the detector is marked, is flat. It's perfect. So even if the concrete does this, then the top of the walls will be flat. So what he does is he marks that tick mark with an arrow up. And then he's gonna do the same thing here. He's gonna do a stud there, a stud there, because we're gonna have a beam that goes all the way across. And so by a control point there and where he's at, we can make sure that that's nice and flat. You've been working out? So the trick here is just to hold the two by six plumb or plumb enough, doesn't have to be perfect, and there it is. Now, whatever the height down from that stud to the control mark is, we're gonna write that down and probably average it just to see if they're the same. And then that's what will go up from each control point. So this is a garage wall. Obviously it's gonna have a header across the opening. So what we've done is we've extended this wall through as opposed to that wall. And the reason for that is so that this wall can get sheathed all the way through. Then this will get a six by six that's gonna support that beam. And then camera keeps going weird. And then that wall will be sheathed from here to the outside and everything will be connected together. There's a lot of different ways to do what I'm doing here, but the laser plumb bob to me is the fastest. It sends up the dot perfectly plumb so I can get an accurate measurement for those top plates, even though the top plates are two foot difference in height, about a two foot difference in height. I think that's like the Stabila LAX300G. I'll put a link in the description below. We've been using this for a long time. We started using laser plumb bobs way back in 2004. I think it was an old PLS laser, like a PLS5. Loved that thing. But laser plumb bobs are your friend. They make things much easier. Okay, so now that we've got the top plate for that wall cut, we can lay it out but then I'm gonna go ahead and cut some pressure treated bottom plates for those wing walls. So Kyle's got one there and it's drilled and tested to fit over the bolt. Now remember, you only drill 1 16th of an inch bigger than the anchor bolt. So 5 8 anchor bolt, 11 16th bit. That means we need to be very accurate because we're gonna build this wall here and bring it over there. We're also very careful as you can see the way I'm holding it to make sure that we don't somehow build this backwards. We've done that before and had to drill out the plates. So, and I'm sure that we will do it again. So here's how we set this up. We've got a snapped line on the floor for when we snap lines. So that's just our reference point. So I toenail on each end and I'm gonna use that top plate to perfectly locate the other side of the wall and its bottom plate. Okay, does that make sense? So the top plate really is our reference. And remember, we have confidence in it because we measured it using a laser. So there's no discrepancy there. So I just toenail that bottom plate and I transfer all the layout. Now oftentimes with these wing walls, we have hold downs. We didn't on that wall. So that gives us a little bit of flexibility. Otherwise you're lining up your framing with that hold down and also the anchor bolts. And it can be a little tedious, especially as that wing wall gets shorter. So while I've transferred layout and tacked the plates, Kyle's already started cutting stud heights. Now it's just a matter of assembling the thing. And then we're going to make sure that it's that, that the, each end is parallel and that we're square. And I think this is gonna be pretty obvious as you see us do this. That six by six that I'm nailing, that's what's going to support that beam that we mentioned. And you'll see us lift that beam in at the end of this video. Awesome Framers made another mistake. <laughs> so, <laughs> that nice reference line that we just talked about. Yeah, remember, one side is two feet higher, so <laughs> not a big deal, right? A 
I think you know by now if you've watched the channel, Awesome Framers was always a joke name. The story behind our Instagram account is that we just wanted to film the dumb stuff that we did for our friends. And then lo and behold, other people eventually found it funny too. So it was never designed or intended to be serious. There's a lot better framers out there than us. We're holding the header tight to the top plates because we don't yet know the exact height of the concrete slab in the garage. So by holding it up, we'll be able to frame down to our exact eight foot door height later. So, and you'll see too when we sheet, we leave it a little long to account for that. This was the first job that we got to use this 10 and a quarter inch cordless Makita saw. So there I made a mistake and my trimmers were too long. Not a problem, they're all nailed together. I can cut that quarter inch off at one time. Now, because these are garage portal walls, everything gets nailed essentially three inches on center, including the sheathing. And that's because the shear forces are higher because the walls are narrow and they're tall. If you just Google garage portal wall framing, you'll find a bunch of articles about that if you're interested. Now, that is the taller side where I'm at. Now we need to square and make this wall parallel. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate it. I'm gonna measure the height at the far end, and we already know the length. Then we're gonna pull a diagonal. So there Kyle's pushing or pulling. One trick to that, if you have a sledgehammer close by or you push with your foot as you hit it, then you can tap it. So now that it's square, we make it perfectly parallel. So let's just say that the number on the top was 12 feet. Then you guessed it, it needs to be exactly 12 feet at the bottom. If one side is square and then the other side is parallel, then both of those are nice and square. Make sense? So real simple, don't mess it up <laughs> because we're gonna sheet this. And by the time we nail it off three inches on center, well, that would be a little difficult to fix. Now, like I mentioned, because these are garage portal walls, our engineer specifies that the blocking in those wing walls needs to be plus or minus, I think it's one foot from center. So essentially we want that blocking at the center. We use the scrap six by sixes, basically because a lot of times our walls have six by six as trimmers or for backing for the um, hold downs, we'll use the cutoffs for that blocking. This is way overkill but it's a garage portal wall. We figure it's a good place to use it up and you can't miss when you sheet those walls. Even if I nail it with my eyes closed, we're not going to miss. You notice that Kyle is dropping sheets at the top and he's running them horizontally. The rest of the time we run almost everything vertically. So for us it becomes a function of which is the most efficient use of materials for that given wall. So in this case, it made sense to run horizontally. Primarily because we can do either. Let's just say it this way. We can do it either way because all panel edges are blocked. I'll put some links in the description below because I know some of you that might be just like a brand new thought. Additionally, remember, we don't know where the garage slab height is yet, which also means we don't know where the top of the door is. But besides that, we don't want the sheathing to hang too low that as we walk in and out, we're hitting our heads. <laughs> so we have a rough idea within a foot. So we go ahead and snap a line and then we're gonna cut that off. So we snap two lines. One is the bottom of the header and that way I know where to nail. Remember, all of my nailing needs to be three inches by three inches at those portal walls where they meet the header. And then we snap another line just to cut the sheeting off so that it's not in anybody's face. The nails that we use are a two and a half inch by 0.131 inch nail. It's a true common nail. We don't, we don't cheap out on nails when it comes to our shear walls. Now, here is the beauty of the router. We can use up our scrap and not really have to measure anything. And on this job, we attached it to a router pole. That way Kyle doesn't have to bend over. Look at how easy this is. Also, we did bend the handle a little bit more so that we don't have to bend over.
Before you get too judgy, don't forget, this was the first time we used it with the pole. Actually, it was the back garage wall, but this is, I think, Kyle's first time. So there's a little bit of a learning curve to it. When we get to the great, great wall, you're gonna see how much time this thing saves. Again, we're just gonna say it, clean up as you go. Most of that scrap is reusable or we can use it somewhere else, especially because it's got perfectly straight lines since we routed it. So we just stack that stuff off to the side where it's easily accessible. Our, our goal, and I think I've said this in previous videos, is to really minimize scrap on sheet goods, especially when lumber prices are high. That's really where it pays off. Now, because it's zip system, we tape the seams. On these garage shear walls, we typically don't tape very many of the seams because the inspector wants to see that nailing, but they can still feel and see the nails on those two horizontal seams. So I felt comfortable doing that. And this time of year, this was, you know, just the start of winter. We try to tape as much as we can because we just never know when we're gonna be in for like two solid weeks of just rain. Which actually previous to this video, we had a series of atmospheric rivers at Washington State and we, we just broke all kinds of records for rain. Oh man, it, it was kind of miserable. So we just didn't even work. We're not done with this wall yet. Now it's time to get into the soffit framing. This is a really easy and idiot proof process. We've never gotten it wrong. Yeah, I know, I'm probably gonna get the next one wrong just because I said it. The reason why we don't get it wrong is because we draw it out. Either I'll draw it out in SketchUp or we'll just draw it out on a sheet of plywood. I think our measurement was like two and an eighth down. Now in this wall, we used up some two by six, but on the rest of the walls, you'll notice that we use up two by four because we don't need it to be that tall, but we do want two by six for our subfascia. So we're using 12 inch by 16 foot long vented LP soffit. So we make the, the soffit here, we make it 12 and a quarter. And that just gives us a little bit of room for movement. All those blocks, therefore, are nine and a quarter, and they come out of our scrap pile. So that's why we, we, tend, we tend to get through most of our scrap pile. The beauty of the LP soffit is that it's long lengths, it's easy to handle, it's a wood product, and it helps to keep these walls straight. And so later, that means less bracing on walls. We're nice and tight to a flat floor, <laughs> and then we can align the soffit to the factory edge on that soffit board. I switched guns to that Makita high pressure siding gun. This thing weighs like four pounds, it's so light. Galvanized siding nails, right? Because now we're to an exterior application. Switch back to the framing gun because that soffit is not yet, it could be, but it's probably not yet 90 degrees to the wall. And remember, when we have a wall set plumb, our soffit 90 degrees to that will be level. So here's how we do that, very simple. We just grab a couple scrap blocks we actually stopped recently cutting bevels on those because it doesn't matter. So I tack one in and then we push it with the square. This one did take some rocking and rolling, so Kyle had to help me. We tack it, now it's nice and square on one end. Here's a closer look at that. Okay, so nice and stiff. Eyeball it for straight. If we need to add more braces, we'll do that. So obviously it is a little tedious dropping this over the anchor bolts, but because we had already dry fit, if that's even the right expression, when I drilled out the mud sill, I laid it right over and put it in place. So I knew it was gonna be in the right spot, but it still is a little tedious to actually drop the wall on bolts. It's a lot easier with two people, but we don't have a third person right now, so. Once that wall's fully seated on the concrete, then Kyle adds the three by three bearing plates and tightens the nuts then I can ditch the rigging and the wall is going to stay right where we want it to stay. The reason why we started with that front wall and the back wall first is because the next wall is going to be a rake wall and when we drop that into place we want to have two walls to attach it to end to end 
and then we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to brace it in the short term. Now I didn't show the framing and sheeting of this wall because it's pretty straightforward and I'm gonna go into a lot of detail when we get to the great, great wall. It's the biggest wall we've ever built. This is the fourth time we've done this house. So we've got that down and I'll show you that whole process all the way through. We're gonna go ahead and side this wall before we lift it. And I'll get into how we get layout later. You notice an extra piece of tape on the right hand side. So I'll get into that as we go here in just a moment. So first of all, Kyle's the cut man and I'm gonna be the install guy. So we stagger all of our seams in four foot increments. So because these are 16 foot boards, we cut four feet and then eight feet. So that gives us a four foot, eight foot, 12 foot, and then of course the factory 16 foot. And that's how we stagger. So everything starts on one end and that's how, the stag how we stagger it back. Obviously we put on a spacer piece at the bottom because we want that bottom piece to be kicked out. Then in order, it's a 16 foot piece, a 12 foot piece, an eight foot piece, a four foot piece. Kyle measures in the scrap to a snap line at the other end of the wall. So he's able to fill those in while I go. And then we're going to lather, rinse, repeat, as they say. Notice that I'm putting in slip sheets or little five by eight step flash. I think they're like 50 to 60 cents a piece. Actually, I should buy them since prices are going up. The reason why we do this is to avoid caulking at the butt joints, which is a maintenance item for the homeowner. When you do this though, make sure that you get all of the ends of that siding an additional coat of paint. That's according to the LP instructions. Okay, so now it's just a matter of siding the wall like a hardwood, guys. We're gonna put down hardwood. On the right-hand side, we've snapped a line one inch from the end, and that's what I'm lining up all of that siding with. And I'll show you that in the future. Basically, the reason for that is and then we can wrap tape around the corner when it mates up with the other walls. So now it is literally just mindless rhythm, which now that I'm thinking about it, it would probably make a great title for my memoirs someday. Life on the job site, mindless rhythm, life on the job site, according to Timmy Euler. Fiction. <laughs> I'm keeping, ah oh man, I don't even know why you guys watch these videos. Not gonna edit that part out. Literally mindless rhythm, as you can see. Nice to take a break every once in a while and dance like you saw me a little earlier, stretch out that back. It, it, there are some people who keep commenting that they would rather work off staging and things. They think this is too hard on the back. I don't find that to be the case. I don't really care to do the siding this way, but it saves us so much time, especially because we're about to pull out a secret weapon, thanks to Mark Hendrickson. Mark is a really good framer on Instagram, by the way. It turns out we're basically the same age and basically the same person, except he's way cooler than I am. Now, what is the secret weapon as we go up the gables? You will see in just a moment. Who wants to mark angles? I don't want to mark angles. Who wants to measure angled pieces? I don't want to measure angled pieces. So let's not do it. There in the foreground, there's that one inch gap at the tape seam, and then we're gonna wrap that tape. That'll make sense later. You guys ready for the secret weapon? Have I built up the anticipation? Okay, we're about to get into it. See if you can figure it out. I'm not even gonna talk. talk we have to we have to talk about it this is the first time we've ever done this so you guys you guys are gonna see okay I'm, I'm shutting up now Okay, so here's the trick. I'll explain it in just a moment, but as far as cutting, make sure that you set that depth right. What I find is that the more I'm doing this, I'm being too conservative. I don't wanna cut the zip below. I don't even wanna score it. And so sometimes the cuts need to be finished. Oh, there goes the camera. Uh, Advantech, flat out best. With a lifetime, whatever it says there. Okay, we're back. So 
like idiots, let the camera fall. But I'll explain this in just a moment how it worked out. Now we're gonna start framing our closed soffits. Closed soffits at the gable ends for us is very similar to the horizontal soffits. It's two by six framing, nailed to the double top plates of the wall below. 12 and a quarter inches deep because we're using solid LP 12 inch by 16 foot soffit. The long lengths really help. Honestly, we really don't need braces and we have perfectly straight overhangs in large part because we're building on a flat floor and then that LP soffit keeps it straight as the wall goes up and we set it in place. So really easy, we don't even lay out those blocks. We just kind of eyeball about every eight feet. Because it's a factory end on that soffit board, we can keep everything straight with it. So essentially those little spacer boards are just at the bare minimum. We used to run them two foot on center. We're like, why? That's just extra weight, extra cutting. It's a waste of time. The barge boards, or we call them fly rafters, it's five quarter by eight LP smart side trim. Like an idiot, I think I made a mistake and cut them a little short, so we had to patch in at the top. And to attach the five quarter by, I'm using a Milwaukee 15 gauge nailer. I really hate this gun. I do not recommend it. But since we bought it, <laughs> we, got, we got to use it until, until we drop it and it dies. We've had really good success with the 15 gauge nailers. I prefer the 16 gauge from Passload, and that is in the instructions from LP. Also, I'm painting the cut ends. Okay, I'm gonna do this for the third time really fast because I, I wanna get in 45 seconds or less. So, pre-sided the wall. We never cut any, or we never measured any of those. We ran them all wild. Tape the end, snap your line one inch back, run all your siding that way. That way we can tape the other side for a minimum one inch overlap. Pop a line, six and a quarter down, two by six plus the soffit plus some cheating. Cut them off in place. That gap, by the way, this was all Mark Hendrickson's idea. Thank you, Mark. It turns out we are identical snowflakes. That 3 16 gap is exactly what LP wants, but we're even gonna do better than that. Cover it. Cover it with a one by six. And then what we're gonna do is add our pork chop once the walls are up. Boom. I, I love all of you. We'll see you guys on Monday. Since this was the first time we had done this, we were still kind of working out some of the details. So I thought for sure that I was gonna go ahead and put the pork chop on now but turned out I don't need to. We just, we, it'll make sense in the future what the pork chop is. Basically it's a triangle piece that, that covers the horizontal soffit and allows the corner board and the shadow fascia to terminate. And we just call the shadow fascia that one by six that Kyle had in the previous little section up underneath the soffit. I promise it will make sense in the future. Since the camera fell, you didn't get to see the rest of it. So I'm just gonna skip to the next day and actually lifting the wall into place. So with the wall in place and over the bolt and leaning against the back garage and the front garage wall, what Kyle does is he goes ahead and installs the three by three bearing plates and the nuts and he tightens those down. Then what we're gonna do is we're actually going to connect those intersecting walls. Would you like to know how we connect that rake wall to the intersecting walls? Watch. Oh, thing of beauty, look at that. Soffit comes right out to that gable soffit. Beautiful, what about our heel stand? Right on the money. <laughs> it's usually within a quarter of an inch. I'll just be completely honest with you guys. Okay, here's a better look from the back. So in this case, he's gonna toe screw down because we wanna just suck that wall nice and tight down to the concrete. And then watch, he just pulls it in. 
Now look at the soffits. Boom, just pulls it nice and tight. There it is in slow motion. Tight! <laughs> and then he's gonna put a Simpson strong tie, so same screw, the six inch SDWS screw from the stud into the stud. That's gonna hold it in place so we can stitch it up. Look at the soffits, oh, everything comes out nice and flush. Yeah, but like I said, you know, within a quarter is good enough for us. This one just happened to be very photogenic, so we got lots of drone footage. It looks good. Then later on, we can add an A35 or a strap and connect those walls. We're gonna stitch up that sheeting, then wrap the tape. Since I can't trust that the beam looks good or has a good cut from the yard, because a lot of times they're out there with chainsaws, you gotta register one side. so that I can avoid having to keep flipping the beam over to make the cut. I'm using a beam saw. However, that beam saw will only cut three and three quarters. Got sawdust in my eye. Normally we would wait to install these beams. We're doing that now just so that that whole garage section is all connected together. The front wall, that little four foot wall where the ladder's at, that's already sheeted. We held it plumb and then nailed it off. Then we took our measurement for the beam across the bottom, cut it a quarter short, you want a little bit of leeway. We're gonna set that beam, and then what we're gonna do is pull that back garage wall plumb. Why don't I just show you that whole process? Same thing, we're gonna use the nice big five or six inch SDWS screw. We're gonna connect it up. If we need to move something, we can easily pull them out, but they're insanely strong. Far stronger than nails. Just make it easy, just make it easy. Of course, later we're gonna strap those top plates to the beam and we're gonna add a little connector plate to that, um, that six by six. Okay, now notice here. Kyle's gonna come in through the soffit framing. We have the little Stabila laser on the ground, so he's gonna pull that in 
until the wall is nice and plump. That's what he's telling me. He's like, watch this, watch this. <laughs> you gotta keep it fun, you gotta keep it fun. Go for it, man, just do it. See that, now he looks at the laser dot. Tighten it up just a little bit more. Boom. Then additional fasteners right through the beam pocket or channel. The beam is sticking up the same height as our rafters, and so that means some of it is sticking down into the garage. Okay, here's the laser dot. I'm gonna try to zoom in there. Golf cart in the background. There's the dot, do you see it? Yeah, I was like, nice and straight, it's plumb. There's the dot, about six inches, eight inches in right there. <laughs> Split the beam right on the corner of the plates. And there's the little Stabila laser at the bottom. Beautiful, nice and simple. Thank you guys for watching. Please hit that like and subscribe button. I really appreciate it. We have a lot of really cool stuff to show you on this build, so stay tuned.